Good day, everybody, and welcome to the fall semester. We are so excited to actually finally be at this time. We have been planning for this for months, literally, and we are so excited to start the fall semester. So here's what we're going to talk about this evening on this town hall. First of all, just the planning that has gone in, just so everyone is aware. Uh, then three topics, protecting our community, planning for excellence in our education and maintaining our strong community as we go into the fall. And then we have a handful of guests, including Dr. Satul Patel, who is our medical expert who will be assisting us as we go through this semester and has helped make sure that we are prepared for this semester. And then finally, committing to a successful semester. So let's get started. Rule number one. Most important, if you take nothing away from today's conversation is, when in doubt, please stay home. Our whole goal this semester is to make sure that we can continue to provide the building access to as many people as possible to in, keep our classes going. That only is possible if we are able to minimize coronavirus, to keep it outside. If you are sick, do not come to campus. If you feel that you may be sick, do not come to campus. If you can spell the word sick, no wait, that's too far. But seriously, if you are at any risk, if you have any doubt, if you have any symptoms that you're not sure about, please, please stay home. Do not come to campus until, uh, unless you are safe. That is the best way to make sure that we can minimize the risk for everybody. So let's move on to what we have done this year, planning for the semester. We have always used our three guiding principles. Number one, the safety and security of everyone in our community. Number two, providing excellence in our education. And number three, making sure that we protect those things that make South Texas strong particularly our community. So to do that, we have done many, many things and have been working all summer. We've modified the building in many ways. Uh, we have built three new classrooms so that we can ensure that we have social distancing in classrooms. We have modified the classrooms that we do have. There's plexiglass around all of the podia. We have identified where students can sit so that we ensure that people are separated sufficiently. We have turned the tower into NASCAR, left turns only. When you get off the elevator and go onto the hallway, you will make the quick first right and then everything else is counterclockwise. So nobody is meeting in the hallway. Stairways are either up or down and not both so that we don't have to bump into each other in the stairways. Trying to do everything we can to ensure that we keep people safe. We've also modified the schedule, as you know, and have this now mix of in-person and online classes that was driven by the survey results. Your selections helped us determine how to set up the schedule for the fall. And we've done it in a way so that it actually is really successful. The most recent communication from the county judge indicates that when schools reopen, they should reopen with one, uh, only one quarter of the population of the school in the building. And it works out that our most significant time is Tuesday and Thursday at 1030, when we will have a grand total, if everybody shows up, of 172 students in the building, which is less than 20% of our population. So we're actually meeting, exceeding the thresholds set by the county judge. Uh, we have limited travel events and visitors. So at least through the end of September, and we'll review on a month to month basis, we will not have any special events, any events in the building or any school sponsored events, any school sponsored travel, because we're trying to keep our community safe and a whole slew of new policies and procedures. So as I move forward, you'll see three questions. And what I'm basically asking all of us to do tonight is commit to this semester. And the first area I'm asking you to commit on is in protecting our community. 
What will you do to keep everyone in our community safe and healthy? And I ask you specifically, everybody on this call, because we're in this together. Each of us is responsible for each other's safety. If I bring it into the building, coronavirus into the building, I am putting everybody at risk. If any individual student or faculty member brings it into the building, we are putting people at risk. We are a self-regulating profession. We are responsible for regulating our own behavior, for governing ourselves. And I'm asking each of us to own this tonight. What will you do to keep our community safe? Here are some of the protocols that we're putting into place. First is we're asking everyone, please, at all times, practice safe distancing. What this means is, number one, when you are on campus, you will have a mask on unless you are in an individual office or in a space that is not a common area. Anytime you are around any other individual, anytime I'm around any other individual, we will have masks on. We will be separated by more than six feet. We have hand sanitizer throughout the building and we're adding more stations on a regular basis. Please use it frequently. Practice safe distancing. That means that we won't have eating in classrooms because that's not safe. So we're gonna prohibit that because that's what we are all doing to keep our peers and everyone safe. Also, please take precautions when you are not on campus because your behavior off campus will affect your health and the health of everyone on campus. Again, we all have this responsibility. We also wanna make it easy for everybody. So we've identified this app. It's called the Return Safe app. And most colleges and schools are using some form of a screening device. And this is the one we have selected. We found it to be very effective. Before coming on campus on any day, you will answer a series of questions. Are you, do you have these symptoms? Do you have a positive COVID test? Have you been around somebody who in the last 14 days who has, uh, has symptoms of the coronavirus and of COVID-19? Every day before coming to campus, you will clear and go through these and you will get a badge, a screen that will show that for that day, you are able to be on campus. And Jerome and the security staff up front will check that badge of every person who comes into the building that day. We also selected the Return Safe app because we also have an obligation to assist with contract tracing if anybody does get sick. And this app has the ability to identify whether your phone and another phone have been in proximity for long enough that you might be at risk if that other individual reports that they turned up positive for COVID-19. Now this app is, uh, we we're very worried about privacy. We're very worried about making sure that uh, there's no big brother component to this. So this app only works when you are inside the building. It is geofenced to our specific location. So when you are in the building connected to our Wi-Fi, it recognizes that you are in our location and it looks for other phones that are nearby. And if an individual reports that they were positive, the other folks who were, have been near that individual will get a notice that someone they were in contact with Will, ha, has turned up with COVID-19 and you should quarantine. This is the best way that we can make sure we are contributing to keeping ourselves, our community, and our city safe by identifying if anyone comes up with, the, uh, with COVID-19. Again, please stay home when appropriate. Again, when in doubt, stay home. You can watch classes, you can participate in classes online. There's no reason to come to class if you are at risk. And finally, please report any COVID-19 exposure, whether it's a positive test or you've been in contact with someone who has symptoms or a positive test, please let us know. This is a no judgment zone. There will be no indication, no recriminations, on you, 
it is just imperative that we are able to keep track of anybody who is sick, not only so we can protect others, but also so that we can provide you with assistance and with services and make sure that you don't fall behind, that our, your professors know, and that we can help you through your illness. So what are you going to do to protect our community? Please make sure that each of these is on that list. Second area that is always a focus for us is maintaining excellence in our education. And as we transition so that many of the classes are online or in a hybrid format, that is different from being in person. It's not necessarily better or worse. And in fact, our faculty have been working all summer to redo their classes for a different experience. We hired an expert in online education to work with all faculty members, and he has been working with them since May to ensure that the online education that we have this fall is planned and very different from the emergency approach that we had to take in the spring last year and that every school had to take in the spring last year. But it's different. And it will require a different approach by all students and faculty. It will require a different commitment level. So the second question, what are you going to do to ensure that you receive an excellent legal education? And a couple of thoughts on this. One is prepare for online learning. Different preparation, different approach, different ways of making sure that you are present while you are online that you're not distracted, that you have the ability to participate in the class in a real way, even though you may not be physically present. Take extra advantage of faculty members' office hours. That connectivity that you normally have just seeing the professor before or after class, staying after to ask a question, may not be as convenient. Take advantage of the office hours, send them an email. One of the things that many of us have realized is that it's really easy just to schedule a 15 minute time sometime and just jump on Zoom and have a quick conversation. So reach out to your professors. Make connections with those in your class as well. Reach out to them and make sure that the study groups that you would normally create, the connections that you would have before and after class, that you're still making those connections and make a schedule. When we are on campus, it's very easy to have a set schedule. You leave your house at a particular time, you go to campus for these days, you spend this time, you study in this break, etc. When we're at home, it's tougher to do that. We can get distracted very easily. It's important that we have a schedule, that you have a way of making sure that you're on track and that you're keeping distance between your school and other things and you're keeping that balance as well. It isn't necessarily healthy staying in your home for 24 hours a day without having some structure, some discipline to that. So a schedule can be helpful. And then finally, maintaining persistence. I know that several of us at the end of the five weeks of Zoom in the spring, we're getting tired of it, but we know that this is going to be a semester's worth and it is definitely not a sprint. This is a marathon and making sure that you are prepared for that, that you have that persistence to prepare for. So again, what will you do to make sure that there's excellence in your education. You own the quality of your education. Every single one of us, what you put into the class is what you will get out of the class. Plan for it, be prepared for it, and make sure that you own that responsibility. The third question is, we have a wonderful community at South Texas. We have a strong community. We have a supportive community. We have a diverse community. We have a community that cares about each other. It's going to take a little effort for us to make sure that we can maintain that in this new environment. When folks aren't on campus as frequently, when you don't bump into people in the hallway or down at Candyman or in the library or uh, going into uh, one of your activities. It's going to require a little more work. And I've asked Kirk and the, his team to make sure that he is just truly on steroids 
for student organizations and participate in them. If last year you did one, do two. If you did two, do three. That connectivity is going to be even more important this year. And watch for activities, whether it's something in the career services organization or something that Vice President uh, uh, we're going to be doing with our diversity that Vice President Moore is going to be doing, or uh, guest speakers that we'll be able to do via Zoom because it's so easy to bring guest speakers in. Participate in those. Make an effort to really live and be part of the community this year and create your own opportunities. Uh, if there are things that we need to create for students so that there's extra connectivity, let us know and we will do that. We will pull out the stops this year to make sure that we have those opportunities. I put on here, imagine the possibilities because this is a create your own world. If there is something that we want you wanna do that we should be doing, let us know so that we can put it on the list, we can consider it and we can make that happen this year. Again, we are a strong community because we have made it a strong community. It doesn't just happen. It's because we have contributed to it. We have been intentional about it. We have made it real. So please take up that mantle. Be responsible for it. Help contribute to the community. I know Lauren Burt and the SBA and all of the activities would be most pleased to have people participate and help support the school this year. So that's what we're going to do. But we need to make sure in this process that uh, we've prepared a safe environment. And to do that, we spent all of this time this year, and then we hired an expert to check our work, to make sure that we were doing what was right to keep us safe. And I'd like, I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Satul Patel, who is, uh, has been uh, at the forefront of coronavirus for the past many months. In fact, his clinical work is done on the Navajo reservation. And he, uh, if you've read anything about how the coronavirus has decimated the Navajo reservation, you can understand the level of complexity that he has faced in fighting coronavirus. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Patel right now. All right. Thank you, Dean Barry. Uh, let me see if I can. You should be able to share screen now. All right. Let's see. Okay. Is that coming through okay? It is. Yes, sir. All right. Great. Well, thank you, Dean Barry. Uh, that was a great intro. You make me want to go to law school now. I need to quit my medical career and, and come join you guys. Uh, but thank you uh, for engaging with us. And it's a pleasure to work with you and your senior team. Uh, we did get a chance to come through for all of you on the call and really take a look at all of the great work that you've done and of all of our engagements uh, you all had by far one of the most successful launches prior to us arriving and so that's a testament to all of the hard work and the uh the thoughtful philosophy that's gone into everything that you've done and what i will say also is what i was most impressed about is no matter what health and safety was promoted and was at the forefront of every discussion that we had. And so that should make all of you, all of the students and, and the faculty on the call, hopefully have a, a large sense of calm and a great amount of confidence as you come back. So I'm gonna use my 10, uh, eight to 10 minutes to quickly go through some slides. This slide deck is normally about 120 slides and I've condensed it down to about 20. I kind of hit the high points and, and hopefully teach you a few things that you can do use in your everyday lives, not just at, at the college, but also at home. So on that note, let's just get right, right down into it. So quickly on nomenclature, um, you know, when you talk about coronaviruses, that's just a general family of viruses. And, and some of this may be reviewed from, for some of you, but I want to quickly go through it. Uh, when you hear SARS-CoV-2, that is the virus itself named after the original SARS virus. And when you hear COVID-19, that is a clinical diagnosis made by somebody like me when you actually have symptoms. So just because you're positive on a test does not necessarily mean that you have COVID-19. Uh, and then keep in mind, you can be an asymptomatic carrier of this and not have any uh, symptoms of COVID-19. For those of you that have not seen this, this is what the virus looks like. 
Now remember, you, you can't really kill the virus, it's already dead. That's how viruses work. They are inanimate objects that are sort of moving around, floating around in our, in our environment. And then once it gets contact with us, it replicates and it tries to go crazy inside of you. So this is what the virus looks like. We're gonna talk about a few of these things here in just a second. So uh, just from a symptom standpoint, the, the biggest things that we're seeing in the community are fever, dry cough, shortness of breath. You've heard most of this, but this is by far the three most common symptoms. You will also hear things like loss of taste and smell. That is a highly specific symptom, meaning when I have a patient that has those particular symptoms, I know for a high degree of certainty that you have COVID-19. When you come in with dry cough, shortness of breath, then I really have to run a test on you. So look for those symptoms in yourself. And keep in mind, it can present in a myriad of different ways. It can present as diarrhea, vomiting, stomach aches, so things like that. Anything out of the ordinary, really try, as, as Dean Barry said, first stay at home. Secondly, when you have any sort of somatic symptoms, go see a medical professional. Better safe than sorry. To his point, we want to try and, and keep your student community as safe as possible. And then the other thing I, I often hear at times is, is this is just like the flu. And, and folks, this is not like the flu. It does share some symptoms with the flu, but the biggest thing, I draw your attention to the right graphic on the incubation time. And for the flu, it's just a couple of days, whereas with COVID-19, it can be up to 14 days with a median of nine days. You can walk around with this and not even know it and be infecting people. Here's the crazy part. Your highest amount of viral shedding, which is when you are transmitting the virus potentially to other people, is four days before you get symptoms, all the way to about five days after you develop symptoms, if you develop symptoms at all. But that nine day period is so early. And by the time people figure it out and they go in and get tested, you're not even shedding virus that much anymore. So the most damage you can do is actually at the beginning. And that's why this pandemic has been so brutal, is for that reason and that reason only. So that's what, how it makes it different than the flu. And also you'll see hospitalization rates are much higher with COVID. So even though death rates were still being kind of deduced, uh, you know, ultimately what they're gonna be, keep in mind that you are much sicker with COVID than you are with the flu. And I've seen this firsthand. Uh, you know, when you, I, I've had literally so many people die right in front of me. So many people that have not had a chance to say goodbye. Uh, please, please, please take this super serious as, as Dean Barry has already kind of set the bar where it needs to be. So how is this virus transmitted? As you all know, uh, there's three ways. Please don't use the term airborne. That is not a type, that is not a, uh, it's a layperson's term. There's three ways, droplet, translocation, and aerosol. Droplet is when we talk, we're coughing and sneezing. There are naturally uh, droplets coming out of our mouths. Uh, typically when we're just uh, coughing, they can go up to about a meter and a half, which is right around six feet. That's where that number comes from. Uh, and so if you're, you know, standing at least six to eight feet away from somebody, even if they're coughing, uh, those droplets likely will not reach you. That's without a mask. And the fact that we're all wearing masks is going to make it even more safe. Translocation is if those droplets touch on a surface and then somebody comes by, touches that surface, and then they also have to then touch their eyes or nose or their mouth. Same thing with the droplets. If the droplet lands on your elbow, really no big deal. But if it lands on your face or, or in the air currents where you breathe it in, then it's a problem. And then the last way is something called aerosol. And that's when those drop, the really, really small droplets are so small that the natural wind and air currents in the room are actually suspending those particles in the air. And, uh, and then if you walk into that aerosolized area, you can potentially breathe them in. And that's where things like air circulation comes into play. And so, you know, uh, you've got great air circulation. You are, you are all indoors, have good air conditioning, and that will help circulate that air. On top of that, you will, all are well distanced. Professors have plexiglass. Everything that I've seen, and I've walked through the entire campus, all of the buildings, uh, you are top-notch protected. All of the best practices are done. Any suggestions that me and my team had were followed without question. And uh, I am, if I was a student there, I'd feel very, very safe. All right, so a busy slide. I promise I'm not going to get to it. But one key point on this, most people, uh, when they go through the stages of COVID-19, they're going to be on that top left, that sort of blue teal colored triangle, 
where you get the illness, you feel bad for a little while, and then it, you get better, right? You may get a little bit of a cough and you feel better. There is a subset of people that is not determined based on age, based on, you know, I've seen healthy people with this, and even people that are, you know, have diabetes, high blood pressure, things like that, but they develop this secondary inflammation stage. That's the orange stage that you see there. Those are the at-risk people. And we're still trying to figure out who those at-risk people are in terms of how we can identify them earlier. But those are the people that are having bad outcomes, the people that are unfortunately dying, uh, is when they hit that, that second phase of hyperinflammation. And that's where all of the medications and everything that we're doing are targeting right now. So, you know, you may just be on that blue phase, but you could be young and healthy and still get unlucky and hit that orange phase. And that's why we're so concerned about this. And if you look at the death rates, you know, the, the older folks are typically the, the, the more at risk. And so it's, our, it's imperative on us to protect the older folks in, in our communities. And even though we may not get as ill, we can still transmit that to somebody else and act as a vector. And that's why all of us are being so careful on this. In terms of treatment options, there is no current antiviral cure. However, there's a lot of really good medications out there. Things like remdesivir, which decreases hospitalization, steroids, which we are now, we weren't giving at the beginning, but we are now giving to every patient, especially if they're hospitalized, which are making tremendous uh, difference in changes in outcomes. Then we also have several vaccines in play. There are three vaccines in stage three clinical trials, and uh, the Moderna one in particular is looking very promising. But if the most, cons the best chance of getting this virus out, it's gonna be early spring. Uh, and those are the people who are at most, uh, most at risk. Everybody else, healthy people, we're looking at really the summer, potentially even the fall of next year. So that's where we are in terms of, of vaccines. Here's the good news. This is data from Texas Medical Center, uh, and this is hospitalization data, which in my opinion is the most important data in terms of where we are in the community. And as you can see, hospitalizations kind of peaked in early July, early to mid-July, and they are trending down. This is good news. This means people are now being compliant with mask orders now that Governor Abbott has made it mandatory. People are becoming smarter about community spread, smarter about crowds, bars are closed. And so people are, are generally behaving uh, healthier and in, in, with more responsibility. So let's keep this trend going. Uh, I think everything that Dean Barry talked about and some of the things I'm gonna tell you about are all gonna keep this trend going down. Keep in mind, we don't know where this is going to be ultimately in terms of waves. And so the Spanish flu in 1918 actually had three waves with the second wave causing the most deaths. So let's just stay vigilant. Even though we know that the trend is going down, that doesn't mean there aren't going to be other trends, particularly in the winter. In terms of testing options, some of you may have been tested. I'm going to just rapidly go through this. There are three major types of tests. There's a molecular test, which is a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It's actually looking at the DNA, or in this case, RNA, that's inside of the virus, in the middle of the virus. So it's very, it's like the, the virus's fingerprint. So it's very, very specific. If it's positive, you 100% have it. If it's negative, you, you don't. The challenge with this test is it takes anywhere from five to seven days to get your results, which kind of makes it kind of useless, but we use it in, in the, you know, particular situations. The second is the antigen test. That's the rapid test that you may have heard. About 15 to 30 minute turnaround times. We really use this test to rule in, not to rule out, and that's important. If you're trying to ask yourself, hey, do I have this virus or not? The antigen test is not the test to use. You have to use a PCR test. If, you're, if we're trying to rule it in, meaning, hey, you've lost your taste and smell and you're coughing and you've had a high-risk exposure, I, as your doctor, may order an antigen test because you probably have it and that's gonna help rule it in very quickly. The last thing you may hear here is the antibody test. And this is really looking at it indirectly. So once your body mounts a response to uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, your body's gonna make antibodies. And what we're really doing is looking at those antibodies to see if you're mounting an immune response. That is not a way to diagnose COVID-19. There are some unscrupulous people that in town that are using antibody tests to, to, to diagnose COVID-19. That is not the correct way to do it. So please be vigilant. Uh, and, you know, I, my contact information is with Dean Barry. And if you have any questions, feel free to just shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, real quick, as Dean Barry said, you cannot keep this virus away from home, school, anywhere. It is, this is, we have to assume it's everywhere. I'm going to talk about that here in a second. 
and any risks you take outside, you will be bringing inside at the school. This is not like other risks that you may take, which, is, which are compartmentalized. This affects everybody in your orbit. So please, please be, please be cognizant of that. You know, this virus knows no politics, no borders, no race, no ethnicity. It just wants to replicate inside of you, right? And so keep that in mind. It's not voting in, the, in, in November. It just wants to replicate inside of you. Okay. So pay attention here. These next few slides are going to be potentially life saving for you. I live by these principles. I've been in the middle of a war zone with this on the, in Northern Arizona. I've been tested many times. I have not contracted this virus all because I am diligent and extremely vigilant about these practices. So right now we're so used to being at the zoo, right? We go to the zoo, all of the danger is contained in cages and aquariums and we're, we feel safe. We walk around, we have our popcorn, we're with our children, our loved ones, and we're not worried about the danger. And that was life pre-COVID, but now we have COVID. And so you have to flip your mindset such that you're on a safari. The danger is all around you. You're only safe in your vehicle or in your zone when you have your tools with you. You have to assume that the virus is everywhere. It's on every surface, every wall, every building, the grocery store, South Texas College of Law, your house, your car, everywhere. And live by that. And so then you adjust your behaviors. Well, like, okay, if it's everywhere, I just have to really change my mindset, right? You don't need to hyper clean everything. You have to keep yourself in a clean state. So keep this in mind as you're living your life, at home, at school, wherever you are, and take the precautions I'm about to teach you. So here's how I operate. I'm either in a red state or a green state. If I'm walking into a building, when I came to South Texas College of Law and I had to touch the doorknob to come in and, and you know, go through all of the steps, no big deal. I wasn't worried about it. I touched the doorknob and I thought to myself, hey, I may have coronavirus on my hand. No big deal. I'm not touching my nose, my mouth, or my eyes. So even though it's on my hand, if I don't touch my face, I can't get it. It's literally that simple. And so I come in, I do what I need to do, I don't touch my face, I don't adjust my mask, I simply just mentally note I am in a red state. When I get to my destination, when we sat down and I met with uh, the, the folks uh, there at the school, I got some hand sanitizer out, I cleaned my hands properly, now I'm in a green state. Now I can adjust my mask or adjust my glasses or scratch my nose or do whatever I need to do, but only when I'm mentally in a green state. This is true whether you're going to the grocery store, you're going to the bank, Wherever you are mentally, I want all of you to know, am I green or am I red? I'm not touching my face unless I'm green. Teach your kids this, teach your parents this, teach your loved ones this. This type of knowledge is what's gonna save lives and prevent spread. All right, quickly about masks. I know I get a lot of questions about masks. Here are the two best mask types to wear. The three layer surgical mask that you see with the blue, the blue goes on the outside. Uh, you want to pinch the nose properly, wear that surgical mask. You can get them all sorts of places from usually Walgreens, CVS, they will have good quality ones. Beware of poor quality masks. As long as you go to a good vendor, like a pharmacy, you should be okay. Second, I see these masks like the N95s. Remember, an N95 doesn't give you 95% protection unless you've been properly fit tested with the shape of your face to that particular mask. So don't Try not to use the N95s, try to keep them for us healthcare folks that are out fighting the fight. And then I also see masks with the one-way valves in them. Please do not wear a mask with a one-way valve. That one-way valve allows you to breathe right out of that mask and it, it renders the mask useless. And the whole point of this mask is to, is to help others, right? Not just ourselves, but to prevent the spread to others. If there's a one-way valve in there, you might as well not have a mask on. And then lastly, uh, the cloth masks. The bandanas and the ski masks and the gaiters, those do nothing. Please do not use those. The best type of cloth mask you can get is a double layer quilted face conforming mask, a form fitting mask. So those are the ones that are kind of tight across your face, attached to the ears or behind your, behind your head. Two layers and they're quilted. They're, they're not very expensive, less than five bucks, plenty of options on Amazon please, please, please get a proper cloth mask. Don't get the ones that are just loose or, or like a bandana. I know the CDC says that's, that's okay, but really that should not be what we are using. Just elevate it up just a little bit, wear a proper mask. 
Okay, travel and commute. Obviously avoid taxis, ride shares if you can. If you have to take an Uber or a taxi, keep your mask on, make sure your driver has a mask on and minimize conversation. Um, and remember you're in a red state. If you get into an Uber, don't touch your face. When you get out, pop some hand sanitizer on, get back into a green state very quickly. Hand washing and ABHR stands for alcohol-based hand rub. You want to have, be a 70% alcohol content, okay? 60% if it's isopropyl alcohol, 70% if it's ethyl. If you don't want to get that technical, 70% magic number. Do not use the 50%, 40% numbers. Uh, those are not good for this purpose. Also, I didn't know how to wash my hands until I went to medical school, right? You want to make sure you wash your entire hands, front, back, base of your thumbs. Don't forget the base of your thumbs and your wrists. At the hospital, we go to the elbows. You don't need to do that. So all the way to the base of your thumbs, simple things like washing your hands properly will, will prevent spread. Teach your kids, teach your parents. My kids know how to do this. They've, it's, they've been ingrained. Wash your hands properly. Uh, and safe distance protocols. And remember, six feet is recommended, but there are times when you can be less than six feet. Let me give you a perfect example of that. Some of your classrooms that you'll be coming into, the people next to you may actually be less than six feet, but that's okay because the people in front of you, where you are potentially you know, having droplets go, that's what we focused on. And so that, those situations may be longer than six feet, right? So we've done the math and I, uh, I've helped the team there kind of make those decisions and you'll see when you get there, but don't be alarmed if the person next to you is at five feet, right? Because we've kind of taken all of that into consideration. And I promise you, you've got best practice uh, setups there at the law school. All right, uh, if you get symptoms at school, get out of there, right? Don't, you don't need to go intermingle with anybody else. Just tell whoever you need to tell, Put your make sure your mask is on and, and quickly and quietly leave the premises and seek medical care. And then lastly, this is the last slide. Please, please, please be mentally well. We are seeing increased anxiety, depression, mental illness during COVID-19, increased domestic violence, unfortunately, and some suicide ideation, you know, Keep in mind for people who are normally rambunctious, who are kind of keeping quiet or, 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 or just not their normal selves, uh, it's okay to ask them how they're doing and make sure they're not in need of, of some help. Also, don't forget to optimize your sleep, your nutrition, and your exercise routines, particularly if you're in front of a computer all day, don't forget to go out and get some exercise and stay mentally fit. And with that, Dean Barry, I think that is my time. Unless there are any pressing questions, I turn it back to you, sir. That was perfect. Thank you very much. Great timing. Uh, there are several questions that are in the on the YouTube stream. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I will be sending an email that has a uh, various documents attached to it, including FAQs, that will should answer all of those questions. So look for that tomorrow at 10 a.m. coming from me. Let me share my screen again. And hang on. Uh, now what I'd like to do is have a handful of our other folks uh, to speak for just a minute or so each. And these are some of the professors who just want to wish everyone well as we are getting ready for our new semester. And we'll start with Professor Page. Uh, I guess I'm here. All right. Uh, Dean Field and Dean Barry asked some of us to give you a little pep talk. I will confess that a dozen weeks ago, I was pretty short of PIP. Um, but I have seen a lot that's happened to the school, and I'm actually encouraged by some of the things that we can now do that we weren't doing before the pandemic. Uh, the, the, the tools that we have, uh, I think, are going to be good. I know that the way we present ourselves and receive information on the computer is different. Uh, but it can also be better. Think of it. Those of you who are coming back to school or those of you who are coming to school for the first time uh, envision a classroom. Some of you will be in those, but many of you won't for a lot of the time. In this kind of classroom that we will encounter, you're always on the front row. In fact, you're always looking at your colleagues and they're seeing your face real big and seeing what you know and what you will exchange with them and with us. 
And I, I know from the spring, one of my classes, when we had to switch over, it became better uh, because we were all intimately surround, surrounding this kind of virtual uh, 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 seminar table that we weren't using in the real classroom. Uh, the advantages of this new uh, environment with no gasoline and no parking fees and no clean jeans to worry about uh, are obvious. But the ones that you will have with the new technology that you will in, uh, you'll be inventing along with the rest of us uh, are going to be really special. Uh, I, anybody who's had a class from me knows that one of the things I drive home the hardest is that the best possible resource you have in the law school is your colleagues. And this encourages use of the colleagues. You will not be seeing them down at the snack bar sharing a sandwich. But what you will be able to do is get with them way easier than a drive to Katie ever would have allowed you to do. So I encourage you to really embrace what's new, have fun with it, and uh, involve your professor. He will be very happy to help you out. That's all the pep I have right now. Thank you, Professor Page. Professor Lewenbach. You may be muted. No? We're not hearing you. And we have Professor Brown Barber while you figure out the sound. I'm happy to step in, Dean. Thank you for inviting me to speak to um, our group of students. I want to say welcome. Um, and welcome back. Welcome to our 1Ls and welcome back to the upper class students. Um, I, we've been dealing with coronavirus since the spring, as the Dean says, and these truly are extraordinary times. And so it's going to require extraordinary efforts on our part. It really is something, though, that we can manage. You know, we're we can think about things differently with the challenges presented by COVID there are opportunities and for um, opportunities, think in terms of opportunities to connect differently with your classmates and to stay connected. I know, um, uh, you know uh, Dr. Patel said that we shouldn't use social distancing and I agree because it really is the physical uh, proximity to individuals that we have to be concerned about, not the social distance between individuals. And I think, uh, think in terms of how to connect and um, I think virtual is the way until it is safer for us to spend uh, more time together. Be creative in thinking about how to do that um, and stay connected because it is important during this time uh, to stay connected with your classmates, meet new um, associates, your colleagues uh, that are in the law school community. We're not in the same space but we're still connected as a community. So, so when you wanna take advantage of that. Um, also, uh, learning will seem different because we are not in the same space, but the material will be the same and we're just presenting it differently. But the engagement that you, you have should be uh, the same as well. Stay engaged, stay, in, stay connected. Uh, a number of you have had me for torts one or two. And so one of the things that you've heard me say before is that the study of law, is not a spectator sport. You have to get in the game. And here, I'm just encouraging you to stay in the game, stay engaged, stay involved, stay connected. And if you do find that you are having um, some, some struggles or some issues, um, take advantage, as the Dean said, of office hours. Mm -hmm. We are here to support you and we want to help you. Uh, don't struggle, reach out uh, because we are a community of support for you. Um, and that is all that I have. So even if I don't have you as a student, you should feel free, free to reach out. If I don't know the answer, I will find someone who can help you. Um, so good luck. I hope you have a great fall semester. It's different, but I think it can be exciting for us as well. Thank you.
Uh, Professor Lewinbuck. <clears throat> Are you there? I'm there. Can you hear me? Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Um, can you see and hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Very good. Sorry. This is an example of what happens uh, on and off unexpected chunk. I was on intercession. I had a, t a technological glitch. So thank you for understanding. Anyway, I am delighted to be here and to welcome all of you to the full semester. I'm so excited for the incoming one. What a big moment in your life. It start your path of becoming that is an honor and a privilege. One of my favorite quotes of all times is by Albert Einstein. And the quote is, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. That's all I've been thinking about in the last few months. That's what our community, South Texas, have been going through as we've been learning to see more and more opportunities and they've been opening up. We have learned a whole new set of skills, both as teachers and as students, something that um, will help us long term. We all will now be able to conduct meetings and social engagements and conferences and professional events all over the world from anywhere we like. We learned new technological skills. And most important, we remained close with each other. We had this opportunity to be together and to support one another during this challenging time. And I'm very proud of where we are. And I look forward to more opportunities that this time will present to us. So uh, welcome to the new students. I'm so excited to see our current students that we missed over the summer, or maybe only interacted by Zoom or email, but it doesn't matter. There are different means of communications, there are different ways of interaction, but we're still one strong community and we're one amazing honorable profession. So I really look forward to this upcoming full semester and it is a challenge, but it is an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, and Associate Dean Field. Thanks very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be speaking to you. I'm a little embarrassed because Dean Barry and I wore the same shirt. We should have called each other in advance, but oh well. Um, so in my new role as Associate Dean for faculty, I have to say I'm really, really proud of my colleagues. Everyone has really stepped up to the plate and shown a great commitment to, to retooling, revisiting, relooking at all the, uh, all the techniques we've used to teach and thinking about how we can best apply them in the new environment. As Dean Barry said, we hired an educational consultant to help us with this. And we worked really hard over the summer at this. And I'm really proud at, at everyone's effort. In my role as Associate Dean, I actually sent an email to all faculty asking faculty to share all the various new ideas that they've come up with and that they're adopting for the for classes this fall in the new environment. And I took I made a bullet point list uh, of notes on everything that everybody did. And I think I filled four or five pages. So there's really going to be, you know, we've really been very intentional about this. And I think uh, I think uh, the, the results are going to show. So uh, the only other thing I want to highlight here is Dean Barry touched upon it, Professor Brown Barber touched upon it. You need to own your education. So you really need to take control and to the extent you need to do things differently this semester, you really have to be purposeful and intentional about doing that. And as long as you do that, you will be able to learn what you need to learn you will be able to succeed uh, the way that you, in the way that you need to succeed. And uh, as many of us have said tonight, we are here to help you. So please just feel free to reach out at any point. So best of luck in the new semester. I'm excited to go. I hope you are as well. And Dean Barry, back to you. Thank you. So a couple things, committing to a successful semester, just a couple of things to bear in mind. There are gonna be changes. 
this world is evolving and we will have to adapt. Plus, we will recognize that there's some things we want to do a bit differently. We want to improve. Uh, so watch for those. Health and safety will continue to come first. And whatever happens, we will be transparent. You will hear from us on a regular basis to ensure that everybody is in the know. We will adapt to current needs as well. If there is something that you recognize we need to be doing or we should be doing differently, let us know. Communicate to us. Communicate with us. Help us be better. We want to make sure that we are here for you. Make sure that we are doing so. We move quickly to the next slide. So thank you for your patience. Uh, both until now and throughout the semester, because there will be changes. And we want to make sure that we're not making decisions prematurely, uh, so that because this situation changes and those decisions will be wrong. So we want to make sure we're making them at the right time. Thank you for your flexibility as well as we continue to evolve and we adapt to these new situations. For your commitment to the school, to each other, to your education, and for protecting others. My safety is in your hands. We are all in each other's hands. Thank you for protecting all of us. Thank you for being South Texas. Again, going back to rule number one, if there's any doubt, please stay home. Please do not introduce the virus into the building if we can avoid it. And be well, be safe. If there are questions, please reach out at questions at stcl.edu. Again, there will be a communication tomorrow at 10 a.m. with all of the information and everything you need to know about the app and about all of the policies that we have going forward. Be safe. And I am so excited and looking forward to seeing you this semester. Take care, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.